My name is Juliana Nicolasian. Also with me is Tanya Fincham. Today is Thursday, September 22nd, 2011. And we're in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, interviewing Joyce and Lloyd Ellis with the Ellis Family Farm. This interview is part of the Oklahoma Centennial Farm Families Oral History Project. Thank you for joining us today. Wonderful to be here. It certainly is. And there's our farm sign. We haven't gotten up yet. Well, we there's don't... always time. Well, we, I don't know, not at our age. <laughs> Well, let's learn a little bit more about the farm. Can you tell us how first your family came to Oklahoma? That's good. good job. All right. My um, folks really came on the train from uh, Illinois. They were fruit farmers in Illinois. And um, my Grandfather came here with five children, and um, my father was six months old when he arrived. And after arriving here, they, um, being fruit farmers, they planted 50 acres of Alberta peaches and 50 acres of um, Jonathan Apples, and then the remainder of the farm was in uh, in hay, and they had horse horses and cattle on that. The farm originally was 156 acres, and it's now down to 132 acres because um, the um, state built four-lane highway on two sides of the farm and took away about 12 acres. But, um, it was 156 instead of 160 to begin with? Yes, and that's because it was at the, um, at the end of the acreage where they make a correction for the curvature of the earth and mm -hmm. These, um, these 640-acre uh, plots are, are trimmed off on the west end of, on the west end of the property. Okay. And we're in Oklahoma City limits. If you can believe that. Well, how did the how did did your did your grandfather have any rhyme or reason when he was looking for a good plot of land? Was there certain things he was looking for that was special about where he settled? Um, probably not. He came here and did a search and lived with uh, some friends for a um, few weeks before he brought his family down. and. Um, Actually, he was not in the run, but um, bought a claim in uh, 1891 from someone else who had claimed it originally. Uh, he would have made the run, but his son wasn't born yet, and the mama couldn't come till she had him. And that's why they were late getting here. They They probably would have made the run, but but his father was waiting to be born. So that made him miss the run itself. But they got a homestead, he got. Well, tell me a little bit about the property. It's, it's now located in what we know as Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. um, does it have a good water source? Mm -hmm. It has one pond on it, probably. Uh about one and a half acres. Well, Oklahoma City ran a pipeline of water down it's the side of it. It's got a 24 <laughs> inch pipeline with five, five fire plugs fire, fire on, on, that, one side. on one side. But uh, you no, know, when they operated it, uh, when my grandfather operated it, um, they had um, only one water well up near the uh, the house. It was drilled to 75 feet and they got water. And um, 
after we took over the farm, we drilled another well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, added to it. But no, there there wasn't any unusual amount of water. Well, they, they started out primarily with the apple and the peach trees. Yes. Um, I guess they were sticking to what they knew. <laughs> yes, yes. They uh, raised the same thing in um, Illinois. They had much better soil up there. Yeah, beautiful soil. But it is surprising that they got as good a production here in Oklahoma because we're really not noted for growing peaches and apples here. But um, that worked pretty well for probably 40 or so years. But then eventually the trees... Um, died or, and didn't produce much and so as a boy I can remember them taking the trees out with a steam engine and pulling the trees out by the roots so that they could convert to um, wheat and oats rather than growing, um, growing fruit. But they the fruit was um, profitable enough for several years so that they were able to buy land in downtown Oklahoma City and build this uh, building. this four-story building. What prompted them to want to build a building? His grandfather was obviously very entrepreneurial. He had all kinds of ideas for this new land and what he wanted to do. And while he did farming, he also did a lot of business too. And that's why he did that. He, um, he was pretty well known in the area after he arrived. And he, um, he became the, the postmaster of uh, Wheatland, Oklahoma, which is about a mile and a half uh, from the farm. And Wheatland now is, I guess, only about 500 population. But he also named the town of Wheatland. His first postmaster. As postmaster, he got to choose the name. And there's, a, there's an, an Ellis Street in Wheatland still that- uh, It's only a block long, yeah. but it's nice. <laughs> Uh, it does uh, have the Ellis name on it. Mm -hmm. uh, are you acquainted with um, where Wheatland is? No. Well, it's halfway between Mustang and uh, Will Rogers Airport. Okay. We're, the farm's about five miles west of the airport. Hmm. So, and now it's being surrounded with great big homes. Well, there's Mainly there's residences. Really? Of course, Wheatland, um, Mustang has grown up to uh, mm -hmm. to the farm, mm -hmm. farm mm -hmm. limits now also. So he was farming. He was serving as the postmaster. He was dabbling with owning other property. Yes. Didn't, he, didn't you say he sold four farms up in Illinois? Yes, he... To move here. Wow. He, he was pretty well to do in Illinois before he came down here. And when they came down, they, they came on the train. And so. Well, I moved to Oklahoma if things were going so... Because it well, was free, new, free land. land. Oh. And then he had five children, and so... <laughs> I suppose he wanted to get land for all of them. <laughs> well, in, in those early days, what were some of the early structures on the farm property? All right, there was the farm house. Um, here's an aerial view of it. There was a farm house. There was a fruit house with a cellar to store the fruit that they grew, and there was a granary that was probably built later, 
But anyway, when I was a boy, there was the greenery was there, and there was a chicken house and a small barn. And an outhouse. Yes. Yeah. Of and course. <laughs> absolutely an outhouse. Plus, that does help me. There was also a storm shelter that was just dug into the ground and with railroad ties for uh, walls and then it was covered over with dirt hmm. and very primitive primitive st storm shelter that farm sits on a hill so you can look around and see all these other little towns nearby and also you can see storms rolling in so that's probably why oh. they built the storm center shelter well, go into detail about the farmhouse for me. Describe it. All right. We did show you a picture. It... Um, one story. Single story. I believe there was only one bedroom, a uh, dining room, and a living room. A kitchen. And a porch on the west side. And... Um, a kitchen. It would have been... It was fairly decent construction. Uh, they did, uh, it was built out of lumberyard lumber and uh, nothing primitive, but, um, and it had a nice porch on the west and on the east. Mm -hmm. And from the porch, you could look over and see downtown Oklahoma City. And being on a hill, that is, and um, other than being small for a family that large, it was fairly nice. Had a kitchen. Yes, yeah, right, a, a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And of course they had a wood, wood stove and for heating and also wood stove for the um, kitchen. Two of his cousins were born out there on the farm and uh, started life out there. And when we took over the farm, to tell you how primitive it was when we took it over, it of course had no lighting, no light, no electricity. We added the electricity and we added the um, uh, water and gas. So it was fairly decent at the time we, um, after we, we had taken it over. And about when was that? That would have been five years ago. About in about 1950. It was pretty late before we got all that. And the tenant, the tenant had lived in the house, was living in the house. And um, yeah. he, he had been our tenant. Now has been almost 50 years the same tenant. <laughs> And um, he was really young when he started, but he looks old now, like we do. <laughs> <laughs> we thought of him as a boy. <laughs> and previously, there had been a, a Czech tenant for 30 years, was, and both of them were family friends. But Grandpa, at one point, did live in the house. Yes, yes. yes. And, and all five kids. And all five kids. And um, and my father lived there, of course, mm -hmm. with them. Well, tell me about Grandma. All right. Um, she was quite... Um, well, really, she died the day I was born. Wow. So His mother right. never forgave her for that. My, Nobody came to see my, the new baby. <laughs> my, my dad had the problem of deciding whether he should go to the hospital where his mother was dying or whether he would <laughs> go to the hospital where um, you were dying. my mother was having, having me as a baby. <laughs> I believe he went to his mother. And he did, he went to his mother. <laughs> he never lived that down. <laughs> but, um, as, of course, I, I, I never knew her, but uh, she was a pretty good business lady and 
took good care of five children and uh, pretty well ran the household while uh, my grandfather evidently ran all the business. Mm -hmm. And later on, after he died in 1904, well, then she operated the farm until about 1917. So, so she had her hands full and did a pretty good job, but uh, it was during that period of time that they lost the farm. Mm -hmm. So everything didn't go real well for her. But, uh, well, what were some of the circumstances leading up to losing the farm? Well, they put they built the building. They put the money into this built four-story building, mm -hmm. and it was first-rate construction. It was a um, uh, concrete steel building, and um, this pretty you know, building. I understand that in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. the, um, there was pretty much of a depression about 1910. Mm -hmm. And um, they borrowed money on the farm and borrowed money on this building and um, lost the building. And then the farm was foreclosed on and put up for sale in 1917. And um, um, my father and mother had just married and um, they were on their honeymoon, but they made an arrangement with a lawyer to uh, bid on the farm. And they gave him a fixed amount that he could bid and told him not to go over that. But, but the price did go over <laughs> that, that, that figure. And, the lawyer went ahead and, and bid the higher figure, and then when my dad got back off the honeymoon, well, they, they agreed that that was all right. <laughs> so, so that's how it come the farm to be in his name then. Was your father a farmer? What did he do for a living? Well, he started out as a farmer, mm -hmm. but he did graduate from college and in Oregon. Uh, then started out in um, at a bank uh, as a bookkeeper and didn't like that at all and didn't do well at it. And so. He got a job with the Frisco Railway, and he became a career railway man and uh, retired as a railway conductor. But during, all during this time, well, he did, in addition to working on the railroad, well, he uh, operated the farm with, with my mother. My mother was a first grade school teacher and a pretty good business person herself. And she and my, she pretty much did um, manage the farm mm -hmm. along with my father. And did they, did they live on the farm? No, okay. Well, my, my dad did originally until you know, he when they were, after they were married until he went to college, and we spent uh, we would spend we built an extra house out there, sort of a summer Cabin. house, and we would spend weekends out there. So we did spend a lot of time, but no, we actually lived in Oklahoma City, and my mother operated. Um, we had an apartment house, four unit apartment house, and my mother operated the apartment house. But she we, was an excellent business lady. She really was. And she really worked on that farm. She'd go out there all by herself as an older lady. And I've seen her, she had a big bull that she had on loan to freshen her cows, and <laughs> she'd get out and had a ring in its nose, it was huge. She was a little woman. She'd grab that thing by the nose and haul it all around. We had a collie pup we took out there one time with us, and 
the little pup was kind of sniffing around that bowl and the bowl didn't like that and it started butting and she grabbed that old bowl and ran him out and I was scared to death. I thought, oh, she'll get troubled by that thing. She's a small lady. But she did a lot of work uh, with the farm and she was the one that got the terracing put in. She, she worked with the soil conservation uh, program to to have these terraces put in and there was a lot of erosion took place because it was a hill mm -hmm. and um, after they removed these trees there was a lot of erosion and she worked with the soil conservation program to get terraces installed and also to get uh, native grasses planted and a pasture established. And she also won several awards uh, mm -hmm. um, that the um, that the soil conservation program gave her presented to her. She was really good. And what was her name? Frankie D. Ellis. Well, as a young boy, do you remember going out to the farm? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, we uh, being as close as we is we almost went out there every weekend. Would you have chores? Well, uh, we would plant gar a garden out there, and yes, I would uh, work in the garden. And then um, after we married, Joyce and I went out there with my, my mother and we planted planted trees. Didn't have any trees, but now we've got too many. <laughs> we overdid it. <laughs> well, these red cedars moved in. Moved in. Mm -hmm. And um, we just recently spent quite a bit of money getting rid of a lot of red lot cedars, of cutting them down. But we that does remind me of a early day story that my father told me. And I noticed one of your questions involved fencing. When they first arrived, they, um, of course, had to put up their own fences, and they used bodark trees, uh, um, posts made out of bodark trees, and we had a real wet spring, and <laughs> those fence posts all sprouted <laughs> and turned into trees. <laughs> but, my father liked to tell that story. You know, there's a cute anecdote. Um, Henry, his father, was the youngest child in this family of five. And evidently, the older brothers gave him a pretty hard time. And he had a lot of freckles. And um, they would torment him. And they'd call him Hen because he was always lying or laying around the house. <laughs> and so the father got mad at him and he told him, don't, don't tease Henry anymore, that's just not gonna work. And uh, they were kind of scared of their father anyway, so they'd peek around a building and go, <laughs> like freckles. <laughs> oh, that was a cute story. Well, you've had long-term renters on the farm, um, yes. originally with your, your mom and dad, and then with yourself. Uh, how would you go about finding the people who rented the land? Well, pretty much word of mouth. Word of mouth uh, they usually always came to, came to us. To, farm had been out there so long and the Ellis's were well known there. And in each case, um, they came to us. In fact, that first Czech family, uh, Bill, his name was Bill Wasicek, the one that stayed with us 30 years, that was through the period when I was a, a boy. Um, he and his brother uh, came over just as teenagers and um, met with my father and asked if they could rent the farm. 
And they were they were so young that my dad didn't want to rent it to them. So he refused. <laughs> and so, so they came back with their father, and the father guaranteed the deal. And so that's the way he they started out renting to these two teenage boys. And um, one of them soon married and moved off, moved away from home, but the other one stayed 30 years for farming the place. And um, they were, the, uh, this one um, farmer was still alive and living in the neighborhood when Joyce and I married in 19, 49 and we used to go out and visit with him and he'd uh, always give us tomatoes or something but we had a, even though um, he was an old man by that time we still had a good relationship with him and enjoyed him very much and his his family were straight from Czechoslovakia and his mother had Quite a world. <laughs> they almost become part of your family when they're with they you were. for so long. That's, they were that's like right. family. That's really right. were real sweet people. And what did he farm? What was he had an adjoining farm, and he um, he's the one that converted from the fruit to to grain, mm -hmm. and he had cattle and um, wheat and oats. And as time went on, is that kind of the same course? Mm -hmm. Yes, Pretty yes. Much. Really, that's what's, what they're doing out there now. It's uh, hay and, uh, and about 30 acres of wheat and mainly cattle. Mm -hmm. It's been hard to be a farmer with no rain mm -hmm. and the dust storms we had back in the 30s. So really putting it in grass and wheat and stuff was a better process for them. And this tenant now um, lives in the neighborhood not, not far from the farm and he is a, mm -hmm. um, he's a construction uh, superintendent. And most of his work is over at uh, Will Rogers Field, and so he's so he can run his farm and have a full time job over at Will Rogers Airport. Well, has the has the farm seen tough tough times in in the thirties? Did the depression make a difference? Did did you see any dust blow through? Oh my yes. <laughs> In the city we did. Yes, Oklahoma City was about the edge of the dust storms. Um, of course, um, in some of the bad storms, they even carried dust clear to the East Coast. But mm -hmm. yes, Oklahoma City had some bad dust it storms, and so, so did the farm. And um, we um, we got help on loans. I think the state had a had a loan for five percent. We'd been paying ten percent on the loan, and, and we were able to borrow this money at this lower amount. and was able to pretty well get through the the uh, depression days with. Uh, with um, the help that we got from state loans. Mm -hmm. I think um, well, now it doesn't sound like any amount at all, but in looking at the records, uh, um, they had a, had loans of about $5,000 on, on the farm. But of course, in, in a depression and back in uh, yeah. our bank. those years, five thousand dollars was quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Particularly when my dad's highest salary 
when he passed away, it was only $3,000 a, a year. $3,000? Yeah. Those were hard times. <laughs> <laughs> sure. They were. Sure. And I can remember when I was seven, I was getting ready to take a bubble bath. All oh, that summer was hot, 36. And it was just boiling hot. And I had the best bubble bath all ready to dive into. Mother said, get dressed quick, get dressed quick. There's a terrible storm. And we, when I got dressed and we looked out the front door, the whole front north side was maroon color. And it was coming fast. And so we put all kinds of towels or rags or anything we could find around the windows because we didn't have all the nice tight windows you have now. And we, when that thing hit, you could hardly see across the room from the dust. It was nighttime almost. So we laid on, our floors were all bare, so we laid on the floor and had wet towels and sheets over us. You could hardly breathe and I had bronchitis really bad and I remember it worried mother and it was just unreal when those storms hit, even in the city. I know all the pictures are out in the mm -hmm. other end there, mm -hmm. and they're pretty dreadful. But it was dreadful in the city, too, and it was really bad. Hmm. You couldn't stand up if you were outside. You had to be inside. And the dust just blew and blew all over the house. I remember I was too little to help very much. I did some. But my sister's about eight years older, and she and mother worked for days getting the windows washed and all that dust out. Made a mess. We had a nice brick bungalow we lived in, but it was just, just really bad. I don't think we've had any storms that bad since, like no. that. We've no. had a few, but not like that. I think about 1937, the storms. Mm -hmm. There weren't any real bad storms after 1937. No, that was about the climax of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any uh, issues with the farms when you get into the 80s? Or, or was everything was, was pretty okay? Well, it was improved. Um, about 1980, we leased a farm for oil and gas drilling and they drilled um, two wells and they produced for 10 years or so and were fairly, fairly decent. It was enough to help us get our two children through college, but <laughs> by the time we got them through, it was all, <laughs> it was all <laughs> There's been a third well drilled just in, my, in 2007, and that one well is still producing. No, no seven. Uh, 2007. Seventy. Two. Oh, se oh, 2007. This last well is 2007. Year, 2007. Okay, excuse me. Got it. Okay. Well, and that probably has helped through the years too with a little supplemental income coming from the farm in addition to, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm assuming there's a, there's a percentage you work out with your renters. Uh, this oh. last renter is on a cash basis. Okay. Just rent. Yeah, oh, okay. Pretty low rent. Very low. <laughs> and he's been yeah. there for what, 45 years? Roughly. Yes. 45 years. I noticed that one of your questions was what might follow. Well, we've got a, a son that works in economic development for the city, city of Plano, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think eventually he will be working to um, develop. develop the farm, but he hopes to be able to hold on to the land and still do some development out there. But, um, Have, through the years, you know, you, you mentioned your farm is in Oklahoma City and the city of Mustang is getting closer and closer and closer. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
have you ever felt the need or have you ever been approached to develop for residential purposes or twice, yes, twice. twice. Yes. really quite quite often i mean is it tempting in this day and age or what what keeps that farm you keep from selling that farm because we love it we really well, do yes. a lot of history there for the and, family um, at our age we don't want to do that but uh, we know eventually we'll um, david can do it <laughs> our, 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 our son can do it, and um, he's, um, let's see, what is he, 42? 44. And he's dealing with brokers all the, mm -hmm. and land developers all the time, and uh, so eventually we'll, he'll be in good position to develop the farm, but we don't care to do it. No, we told him when we die, and then he can do anything he wants to do out there. <laughs> if he can get his sister or something. <laughs> well, back in the day, during your, your father's time, how were records kept on the farm? Or were records kept? Uh, his mother kept my, records. My mother was, um, yeah, did all that. Okay. And... Very efficient. And previously, my uh, my grandmother had done that too. Okay. But my I remember um, my mother keeping books and so forth. And every time they went to some kind of a business transaction, well, they, even as a little kid, they took me along. I remember. <laughs> going out to the state capital when they got the state loans for the farm and I was probably seven or eight, but <laughs> but they always took me along, so I usually knew what was going on. Maybe didn't understand it, but at least <laughs> at least I was there. Well in your your grandfather's time, the time when, when y'all still had the orchard running, how would you get the fruit to market? Wagons, well, horses. And where was the closest market? The railroad um, it's close. was Wheatland. only about three quarters of a mile from the farm. And uh, it had a, had a depot right there in, um, in Wheatland. And uh, yes, they had horse-drawn um, wagons and took their produce uh, to the uh, railroad depot and it was shipped out of, the fruit was shipped out of the depot. And um, the stories are that some years they had several box cars loaded with uh, fruit from, uh, from the farm. And how would they get the help to pick the fruit? Uh, Probably neighbor, word of mouth, I imagine. Yeah, and neighbors, mm -hmm. and you can, in one of those pictures there, you saw probably about 20 or so people. Mm -hmm. And of course there was like five children and two adults in the family. Uh, um, that was quite a tribe there. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit of help right there. Mm -hmm. they, they, all, they all worked. Everybody needed money, so it wasn't hard to find help. Mm -hmm. And that was how they mainly did it, was word of mouth. Or maybe they might have even posted a little notice in Wheatland or something in the post office or Possibly. something. But we don't know that. But anyway, the word got around and they always had plenty of help. Hmm. And he got to name the town of Wheatland. Do you, yes. do you know how, why he chose that particular? He chose Ellis. Berg, and there was too many all over the country, so. He offered five names, yeah. one of which was Wheatland, Wheatland, because it was named after a lot of, most of the folks grew wheat. wheat. He was the only one that grew fruit. Mm -hmm. And so he offered Ellisburg. <laughs> Ellis Bell. And Wheatland, and three other names that we don't know <laughs> what were. But Ellis then, didn't win out. <laughs> But he had a, 
They already had an Ellisburg in New York that had been named after. Well, they came from there, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Before they went to Illinois, they lived in Ellisburg. <laughs> Were the other four siblings not interested in having the, the land? They didn't have the money. They well, them. they all moved, moved, moved. off. Mm -hmm. uh, two went to California. And... Um, the other three were women. And there was... No, they, they just went into other occupations. Mainly, most of them worked for the railroad. There was... Um, mm -hmm. That was good money back in those days, was working for the railroad. He was a three of them, conductor. Yeah, three of the family worked for the railroad. And, uh, and Uncle Sherwin was an engineer. Yeah. He drove the train. So they were well fixed. If you had a job back then with the railroad, that was probably one of the best jobs you could get. Because farming was hard and you ran all the risk of not making much money. But that engineering business was good. I had part of my family was in it too. So that was fun. Were Sundays a special time? Well, went to church I do. Sunday school. One church story I can remember is my father telling about um, getting them all in a wagon and going clear over to an Antioch church, which is on the, the name of the church was Antioch. I think it was probably a Methodist church. It was a Christian church. Was it Christian? Mm -hmm. And it was about two or three miles east of um, Will Rogers Airport. So that would make it almost a five or six mile trip, you know, just to go to church. So it was pretty difficult, but that's <clears throat> what they did. No, they, they, they had a horse and buggy. So I guess they, they went took a buggy. <laughs> they used to ride uh, Wheatland had a little newspaper, and I used to roll it at the historical center. And uh, his aunt was named Rella, and she was she was one of the five children that lived on the farm. And she fat, she was the only girl, wasn't she? Yes. And so uh, she took piano lessons in Edmond, and back in those days, that was a long way away. They didn't have all these fast transportation modes. So she would drive the, get on the train at Wheatland and go to Edmond and take her piano lesson and come back. And they wrote it up like she'd been to Europe or something in this little Wheatland newspaper. <laughs> the whole family would gather around to meet her and her brothers would take her in the, in the carriage or whatever they had to the train. And I thought that was the most interesting thing because it was just for a piano lesson, but they wrote it up like it was a trip to Paris or someplace. But that was that was a big thing for that small area at the time, and that was interesting that she had that. They had a lot of good stories when we were first married. I can't remember all of them, but it was interesting about the five kids, how they all lived out there. And one time, the state fair was on, and they were all making plans, big plans to go to State Fair. And so one person was going to have to stay and watch the farm because they had a lot of cattle and stuff. So the grandfather, his grandfather, rounded them all up and they all hopped on the wagon and he held his one son back. And he wanted to go so bad. And he said, no, you have to stay here and watch the farm. And when they returned, he was gone. And they didn't know for years where he was. He had left and gone to California. He wasn't going to stay on that farm while they all went to the fair. And so he never came back. He never mm -hmm. came back. Wow. For years, they didn't even know where he was. But they found him. Finally, he wrote, I suppose. But he was sure angry. I guess a lot of kids ran off from home then. But I thought that was an interesting anecdote that Rather than stay home and mind the farm, he took off on the train, I guess. Hopped a ride on the train and left. <laughs> Was he the eldest one? No, no. he wasn't. 
About middle. Yeah, kind of, kind of in the middle. Uh -huh. In fact, off and on, I think all the boys at one time, except my father, ran off and didn't tell them where, he, where they were. They came back later, all except this one. But um, I think my grandfather was probably a pretty tough guy and pretty hardworking himself and he expected the kids. the kids to work hard too. And maybe they were back then about like a lot of them are right now. Mm -hmm. So, Where was the closest school for them to go to? Back in Cleveland, wasn't it? Uh, yes. Cleveland was just down the street. Yes, it way. was about a mile, mile and a half. Mm -hmm. and probably grades one through eight, or? Probably was, uh -huh. yes. Most of them were at that time. But after my dad got out of grade school, he he went to um, Epworth University here in Oklahoma City, which later became OCU. And he played uh, football. football for him. Once played against OU. We've got a picture from the newspaper of that. <laughs> he looks just like his dad, just exactly. And it's right across the street from where I went to high school. Yes. Old classic. Is it a good time for your question? No, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> almost, almost. Uh, <laughs> any memories? Any Anybody ever mention anything about door-to-door -door salesmen or hobos or gypsies with the train so close? Well, I really can't think of any. Stories okay. involving, I'm sure there were a lot of them. But. We lived in the city, and one day Mother had been hanging clothes out in the backyard, and she came in. She had my sister, who was a baby, in a little thing she kept her in, in the living room. And she came in to check on her, and here was an old gypsy lady hanging over her was some kind of incantation, Mother didn't know what it was, and made her leave. See, people didn't used to lock their doors. So the gypsy had just walked in. She heard the baby crying, so she walked in. And it scared Mother almost to death. She had my sister when she was 19 years old and had come from a very small town up in Kansas. And so she ran her off, but it scared Mother terribly. But the uh, gypsies used to camp along the railroad tracks on 16th and what was that over there by where your house was? No, um, right out near no, it wasn't where right. Rogers Airport they camped too on yeah. well, this, Castle Road. Yeah, but this was Northwest Oklahoma City off of 36, Northwest 36th Street by a railroad place there. And uh, you'd see them in camp there sometimes when we were little. I, my personal experience was that a lot of um, produce was sold door to door mm -hmm. and they would carry it in, um, in gallon buckets and would usually sell it in that quantity. And uh, so the clever salesman would always put the bad ones on the dump, bottom. <laughs> dump, dump his produce out so that he could show you that uh, that it was good all the way through and, <laughs> and, and not not bad produce on the bottom but I remember um, t tomatoes were sold that way and potatoes and so forth people just going door to door they, they came by our house with little peck sacks with them in there and uh, of course you couldn't see what was in there and mother didn't drive a car and daddy had to pick up the groceries because he had the car but uh, I remember mother gets so angry because the top ones were picture perfect but you get down the bottom they were all wormy and bad <laughs> and so <laughs> a bunch of little kids and I used to stand out when they'd see these guys come along and 
we'd sing, get on the top and rotten on the bottom. <laughs> and it seemed like they used to like to rather tell you how much money it was in quarters or yeah. 50 cents. They, okay. They'd use the term bits, so yeah, many bits. Two bits, and so four bits, whatever. My mother would say, she didn't deal in bits, you have to tell her, <laughs> tell her what it is in English. In plain money. Yes. Well, you, you both grew up, I guess, in the city. Yes. yes. Uh, tell me where approximately both of you grew up and the schools you attended. I grew up in the northwest part of the city, 616 Northwest Eubanks. And uh, I went to Edgemere grade school and Harding Junior High and Taft Junior High and Classen High School and loved them all. And um, I just loved where we lived on Eubanks. That's where I started out. And it was such a nice neighborhood. It was full of kids my age. And we used to get out and play kick the can in the evening. And we, all summer, there were four of us, with our five set out on our front porch, had a big awning over it, and we'd play Monopoly. And two of the boys next door grew up in the high school with Lloyd. They knew each other, and they were older than I was. And so when they started dating, I was real about 10 or 12, about 12, and they were about 14, 15. And they had a party, and I wasn't invited. I, we'd just been always together, and I cried. I can remember crying about that. It broke my heart. They had this big party, a boy-girl party, and I didn't get invited. But I didn't blame them after I grew up and learned a little more. I didn't blame them, but that was interesting because we all grew up there together, and then, oh, it's geese flying over. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, Lloyd went to high school with me. Yes. We were all good friends. Well, where'd you grow up, Lloyd? I grew up on the east side of Oklahoma City. And um, basically it would have been about a mile south of the Capitol building. And I was within walking distance of downtown Oklahoma City. And as I said, we lived in a four unit apartment house and um, one real interesting thing was, in 1928, the, um, the oil field came to Oklahoma City, and it expanded through all that area, and we had an oil well in our backyard <laughs> in this residential neighborhood. <laughs> and um, uh, I went... My grade school and junior high, let's see, my junior high is now on the campus of, um, of um, well, the OU Health and Science Center. And my grade school has um, been turned into one of these um, special... For math and science. Schools for math and science. And my... High school is um, is within four or five blocks of downtown Oklahoma City. It's Central High School, and originally was called Oklahoma High School. And then Daddy went to that because it was it was the only high school in the, in the state at that time. His and father went to that one. Hmm. At night, could you hear the oil well oh, pumping? Sure. Well, yes, yes. We had one right across the street where that two-story house is now, and you sure can hear them pumping. And not bad. It's kind of a nice noise, make money for somebody. But, <laughs> but as a little kid, I watched them drill the well and everything, and I could look out our second-story bedroom window and see everything that was going on over there. And all the way around my uh, grade school and so forth were oil wells, and a good deal of the people in my grade school classes uh, had fathers working in the oil field. Mm -hmm. But it, 
it was interesting from that standpoint. Well, how did you two meet? On a blind date. And um, my, um, my roommate in OU. OU was dating this girl that went to OSU that lived in the dorm with Joyce here. And uh, they introduced They us. got us together. And I had been in the Navy with this uh, this boy, and, and he was my roommate down at OU when I came back and, and started school here. But we just dated seven months. And got and, married. And I was still in school, had no job. No future. <laughs> <laughs> And she had a good job working for the telephone company. So we, I took care of us for five years. We lived on my salary and bought a house. First year we were married, we bought a house. Brand new little tract home out way north of the city uh, called The Village. And oh, we thought that was the neatest thing. I'd never lived in a brand new house and he hadn't either. And Smelled so good and fresh. We were so proud of it. It was a tiny little house, but we loved it. And we had just plowed ground around, you know, on a tract home. So we learned to plant grass and we put, had all that plowed up stuff in the backyard. So we, we must have put a hundred packages of seeds of all kinds of vegetables out there. And we had all these rains. We've been in a drought here lately, but we had rain then. And it, <laughs> we looked out one night and there was so much rain, the little bean plants we had were up about that high and they were floating all around <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> and so there went the vegetable garden. Nothing came up we could use. So we planted grass back there and we put a lot of bushes and trees out. It was nice. His lousy soil, though, well, it was all clay. So he, you'll have to know he's an engineer and he thinks of these things. So we, he built these great big screens, like on, on a screen, and we'd sit and shake it back and forth, holding each end, and shake that awful soil. And it sounds like a total waste of time, but we did that, and one day, five little kids from behind us came out and wanted to help us, and we told them, no, we didn't. We didn't want to do that. We were having too much fun, to be honest. So they finally wheeled us in, and they all took charge, and they did that all afternoon. And we got that whole big wide lot covered. And you know, somebody said that would never work, but it did. We had a fabulous garden back there. And so we, I ran out and planted all the seeds I bought before we took a trip to California. And when we came back two weeks later, all those all those plants were up high because they had all this rain. And they, we had a real beautiful flower garden. I didn't plant vegetables that time. I was disgusted with those <laughs> beans. And we planted carrots and onions and beans, everything that first garden, and it was just all floating around. So anyway, that was fun. And it didn't cost anything much, and we had a good time doing it. We had a very frugal lifestyle, so we got along well, even though he was in school. We we lived very good. We didn't have any problems with anything. It was good. Good training for both of us, wasn't it? That's right. We grew up together. <laughs> so what year did you graduate from OU? In 55, I, um, I quit in my senior year when we got married and um, I got a job as an engineer, although I didn't have a degree at that time, uh, working for a heating and air conditioning supply house in Bricktown. And um, they really trained me well. And during that period of time, I would go back. Uh, uh, I took a lot of correspondence courses mm -hmm. to finish up. Plus, I did go back one semester at uh, OU and then got my degree 
and um, continued working for that company six years and then worked six years in the oil and gas industry and designing um, oil and gas processing equipment. And then I went to the FAA as a senior engineer and um, spent 29 years there working at Will Rogers Airport at the Aeronautical Center. Not far from the farm. No. No, that's right. It's right Real straight close. through about five miles. We, we like to joke that we haven't gone very far. Yeah, in life. <laughs> we never did go very far in life, state, but. <laughs> so you would have been in the Navy before you uh -huh. went to o OU? Uh, yeah, yes. You went on the GI Bill? Yes. For a, for that's a, but one, it ran out when we that's got the, married. One of the reasons that I dropped out when I did the, the GI, GI Bill expired. Uh, um, I was only in the Navy a year and a half, and so I didn't have uh, enough time to finish a full four years. And then, so you went to o well, Oklahoma a and Yes. And what years were you there? 47 and 48. And which dorm were you in? Willard Hall. Do you remember your room number? Oh, I used to. Or I haven't floor, thought. Or floor? On the second floor. Second floor. Uh -huh. What was your major? Home economics. I loved it too. We had wonderful teachers. By then, the the new library wasn't there. You were one time old, so one of the older ones. We can remember when the library was built. Oh God, we were young great. Marys. Yes, pretty young. We used to go up there and visit. You know how beautiful the campus is now. When I went there. There wasn't anything on it but manure from all the different pens. They had cow manure and horse manure and sheep manure and chicken manure, and it was all spread out. That was what our campus looked like. And it rained all the time. Oh, it just rained. So we all had rubber boots that came clear up to our knees because you couldn't have walked in regular shoes. It was just that bad. And, um, oh, my goodness, it it was something to go from the city to that. And I remember the first day there, we had all those shots. They gave you all those shots, typhoid and all those shots. And we came back to our room. My roommate and I had gone to high school and junior high together. We came back to our room and we felt awful. And so all we, we'd been in long lines all day getting registered and getting all this time. And so I said, all I want to do is just lie down and take a nap. And Adriana said, me too. So we pulled back the coverlet there to lie down, and her sister and the roommates had gotten the key to our room and had filled our sheets with soap, dried soap that they don't even use it anymore. Anyway, <laughs> we couldn't lie down on our beds till we did something. So we took the sheets full of soap off and put the top sheet down and laid on it. And we got up, and it was still raining, and we looked out our window at Windsor, Windsor, Willard, and here came a, a, fire, a boy from the farmhouse, and he was chasing this great, huge sow, and it was, the pig was wet, and he'd make a flying leap and grab it, and that thing would go right out, because it was all wet and oily like pigs, and he ran that whole distance from where the library is now, past Willard Hall, and the last we saw, he was still running after that pig. The pig was still jumping out of his reach. But that was a real interesting time. We had, they were real short of space because most of the big buildings had not been built yet. And they were using an old building I had for English, uh, had turrets on it, and real old. And they've since torn that one down, which was good because it, it was an old, I think it was one of their original buildings. So anyway, it wasn't very fancy, but oh, I just loved OSU. I always thought so much of Stillwater and I enjoyed that place so much. I liked the town and I liked the, the city and I liked the dorm and the campus. I was probably one of its greatest 
cheerleaders because I loved it. I really did. I wanted to live there so bad. But I came back home and and uh, went to work and went to work at the telephone company and I had a real good job. I was I was a teller at the telephone company, <laughs> which meant I took the money. <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't let us call it a cashier because they want it to sound better, so we call it a, being a teller. <laughs> Any time in your early married life that you ever thought, let's just become farmers? No. Or no? I would have. On a heartbeat, but Lloyd was more practical, and <laughs> he he was really thin and scrawny, and I was too. But I would love to have lived on the farm. I always wanted to. But. Well, I, we liked it enough that I spent a lot of time out there, yeah. and even right now we uh, we go out a lot. There's very few days go by that we aren't on the farm. We go yeah, out there. We go out a lot. Even now. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah. It's fun to go out there. It's We've spinning. got a nice pond on it. And they started building all these houses and these city dwellers all started moving out there. And uh, oh, our tenant got so mad. This old lady came over one evening. He was out working. And um, she told him she was turning him in, turning the farm into, what was that group? Um, oh, um cruelly to animals because they didn't have any water to drink. And he said, lady, what in the world are you talking about? We have a great big farm pond out here and they have all the water they could ever drink. And he said, these animals are not up for cruelty. He said, they're farm animals. They're not pets. And he said, <laughs> I've been farming out here for years. And he said, you're a city person, so just go back and enjoy your house and leave my farm alone. <laughs> but I didn't blame him. That was terrible. She was really all set to file complaints against him. And um, so city people have a hard time moving out to the country. I'll tell you that. They, really, they, try, to, they try to turn this country into what the city was that they were trying to escape. So mm -hmm. we're not happy with that very much. <laughs> it's right up against us. But we're out there at least once a month. And yeah. Usually often. much more often yeah. than that. And we. Uh, what are you doing on the farm today? If you if you're going out, are you? Well, we, we check everything. Uh huh. Yeah, we and look we, and see what his crops are doing, and we go down to the pond and. And check the water. See if there's ducks there and see if there's fish and there's a great gray, gray heron that great has one. been there for and years and we look for it. Look for it. And then we go by the gas well and I can read the meter and see <laughs> what's going on there. See if the um, <laughs> gas is improving or, mm -hmm. or diminishing. Diminishing yeah. and uh, and usually visit with the with the tenant. He may be over there checking yeah. his cattle, and so we can <clears throat> talk with him. And we had a tremendous number of cedars taken out. These this year. red cedars, red cedars, mm -hmm. which is inundated Oklahoma, as you well know, especially out outlying areas that aren't really farmed as they, such. They, you can see this is a map in 63. You can see there's very few trees, but this this whole area in here was just covered with red cedars to the point that they had covered the grass grassed areas the pastures. where the native grass was and uh, there were trees within three or four feet of each other, so they had covered it. Really, there was a 40 acre area there that was no longer useful as for grazing Pasture. because mm -hmm. of all these red cedars. Did and you so ever see a red cedar burn? No. They well, almost they explode. They, they, really they have an oil in there. Uh -huh. Of needles mm -hmm. and um, they blow up. 
we of course. Put, we put one in our fireplace one year. We had decorated it for Christmas, and so it all dried up. And so Lloyd said, well, we'll just stick it in the fireplace. And it went, whoop, and it almost caught our oh, van on it fire. Just roared and... Oh, it scared us to death. It was terrifying. Then we, we hired a, a contractor to go out there this spring, this this summer, and um, he worked um, two weeks cutting these cedars and stacking them up. And um, we understand from uh, soil conservation people that if a red cedar is cut off at the base, it won't Never grow. Uh, it won't grow up and sprout up like most trees do. You can you can kill them that way. Plus, they don't so, come up from the roots. They have to come up from a seed and a bird dropping. Hmm. That's the only way they'll come up. That's why there's so many of them, because the birds love those little blueberries on there. Hmm. Now, well, OSU has quite a program there involved yes, in they trying are. to diminish these hmm. and try to control these red cedars in Oklahoma. And we had been in contact with them and gotten information from from OSU uh, in regards to the Red Cedar program. So once the burn, the no burn bands up, you can burn the pile or what? That's why, yeah. we, that's we, why we didn't have we didn't all the red cedars in years past mm -hmm. because we had these prairie fires that burned them up. That burned them up. Mm -hmm. But um, those are scary. Those now, fires. now we fight the fires so the red cedars <laughs> can, <laughs> can, can thrive. <laughs> A no-win situation. Well, looking towards the future of the farm, you, you mentioned that, you know, you're going to leave it up to your son. Mm -hmm. Whatever happens, happens. But if you had a crystal ball or you had a, a wish for the next 100 years, don't worry about the economy, don't worry about any other factors. In 100 years, and you were still living wonderful lives, maybe they'll find the fountain of youth, I don't know. Must be a miracle. <laughs> what would you like to see happen to the farm in a hundred years? To be a farm. To stay a farm. I, I can't bear to see it cut up, but anyway, he's more practical. Well, it's surrounded by um, residential property on two sides now. Pretty big developments. Um, I'm just sure that's the direction it will go. But um, our son has done a lot of investigating and uh, he predicts that part of it will be residential and uh, mm -hmm. maybe in the areas adjoining where the residential development is right now. And then the rest commercial because mm -hmm. um, it, it is on a, does have a, four lane highway mm -hmm. on two sides of it. Mm -hmm. So can't hardly there's a little, on that. little piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, where uh, they cut a curve in. Yeah, cut a cut off and that's Section. undoubtedly gonna be a service station of some type where a it's a triangle kind 7 of seven eleven and yeah. <laughs> A oh, Walgreens. Well, yeah, on not big enough for Walgreens. They <laughs> built it across the highway to the regular farm. But there's a little bit, 12 acres cut off that will probably go to something, but probably residential on the, um, commercial on the two sides that are adjoining highway. with um, the four lane highway. Would the government built that road when they approached you what were your initial thoughts well we couldn't have we really didn't have any choice at first they were going to build it diagonal across the middle of it and he's a, a professional engineer so he went and protested that and showed them a better way to do it which they did so they just cut off a little corner of it fortunately i got with the engineer that was doing the design of the road mm -hmm. and we just sat down on his design table and Redid. talked about how we might could alter it, alter his design 
And, and it was better than so one. So he had. agreed to going down on two sides and having a curve mm -hmm. connecting it to 55 mile an hour curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so that was acceptable to us. And so mm -hmm. we agreed with him. We, we worked it out together and that's mm -hmm. and he sent it forward that way and that's what his uh, accepted that supervisors way. accepted and so it's really nice if you marry an engineer it really is if you're dating one at the current time think of marrying him because they're real handy fellas to have he knows all about all kinds of stuff that's we've used over the years haven't we <laughs> Well, she's right in the middle of everything that I ever get involved in. So <laughs> we're, we're a real partnership. Yes, we are. You mentioned you had a sister? Yes, she's 80. She's 92. 92 and bridge. she would have been here today. She had a bridge party. She was having a bridge party. <laughs> She, she is said real she was active. sorry she couldn't come. We but... weren't invited to the bridge party. <laughs> if, if you if you met her, you'd never dream she's 92. She's real wiry. She does a lot of church work at her church. And, and we belong to several different groups together. And she goes all the time. And part of her education was at OSU. OSU. And, and home she ec. was a home ec. A, High school home ec teacher, and then later became a counselor. counselor. And she's and she's moved here all her life too. Yes, and she she um, lives by herself, drives her own car, and very really active in her in her church. And we watch all the football games together. Oh, they she and know you both, and we have just the three of us have a party. We have. All kinds of stuff to eat and and, cold, we, and Dr. Pepper. We always have Dr. Pepper. And we definitely cheer from both from, schools. Both schools. <laughs> and we do this when OSU is doing well. <laughs> You're good Oklahomans. That's we are right. loyal fans. <laughs> and she wasn't interested in owning the farm herself. She's never liked right. the farm. No. I've yeah. always loved the farm and wanted to live there. I always grew up. <laughs> I wanted to be on the farm. I just always loved animals and plants and things, and I always wanted to live out there. And Lloyd's, no, he never did want to, but I, I thought it would be fun while our kids were little to have some horses to ride and to live out there. And I just always wanted to. It's, it was, it when it gets rain, it's a beautiful farm, but right now it's not very pretty because it all dried up, but it's a neat place. And uh, we had very special memories of Oklahoma City, and we're proud to be Oklahomans and proud to live in Oklahoma City, even though we didn't go far in life. That's right. <laughs> How many kids do you have? Two kids? Mm -hmm. Boy and a girl. Had our daughter in 1960, and our son in 1967 or 8, 68. And have they spent any time on the farm or no? Well, our son likes to. Go yeah, he goes there. out there. Mm -hmm. And he, as a teenager, did a lot of hunting on the farm. Yeah, he went hunting out there. And right now he's <laughs> deeply in, involved in, in planning the future of the farm. He's, he loves the farm. And, and so does his wife. She's very mm -hmm. interested in it also. Mm -hmm. Can you still see the city from mm -hmm. the top of the hill? Yes. Yes. You can, yes. Mm -hmm. you can see. That's a selling point in itself, you, not mm -hmm. to do it anything. Yes, but that's right. right. It is. And then you can see Yukon. Yeah. Yukon and more. More. That At least are, the I, lights. I, I reason not to sell. Not, <laughs> not, I reason not to sell. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to mention today about the farm that we haven't asked you about that you'd well, like to share? You've done a pretty thorough job. You've done a job. very good job, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you. It's been a